I'm Brandon Scroggins, a pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and we are so thankful that you've stopped here to check out the content, which is such a central part of the life of our church. We truly believe that there is hope for you right now in Christ. At RBC, we believe that it's vital to worship God, to disciple one another, and to be a witness to the world, to pierce every area of life, every nation and generation with the good news of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe that it's essential to teach sound doctrine in the context of our homes through family worship, and then to gather in corporate worship on the Lord's day and as we can throughout the week as well. You see, at the heart of man's need is the exposition of God's holy word, taking one passage and one verse at a time, understanding it the way God intended it, and then applying it to the whole of life. The content here is made available to church members who are providentially hindered from joining us in person at the time but it's so vital that you stay connected to the life and leadership of the church. But this content is also made available for anyone else outside of our church that would find it helpful. But we want you to know that as glad as we are that you stopped here and are joining us online, I am not yet your pastor and we are not yet your local church. Scripture teaches that it's vital that every person know Christ and then for every believer to be anchored in physical presence into the life of the local church, submitting themselves under the care of faithful, qualified pastors who can shepherd your soul. So I want to encourage you to find and join a local church, if possible, a solid Reformed Baptist church. And if you're not already a part of a faithful, biblical local church, we want to encourage you to come and join us in person as soon as possible. We pray that the content here is a blessing to your soul. The glory be to Christ. God bless you. Well, greetings again to you, RBC, and any guests who are with us this morning. Brian, great job walking us through those names again. And because you did such a great job with that, we're going to give you next week off from names. But don't get too comfortable because we're going to pick up a whole boatload more of them in chapter 8. And then we'll give you all for a little while and then we're going to go out with a bang with more names at the end of chapter 10. And every single one of them is glorious. Question 26 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks and answers in this way. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself in ruling and defending us and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. God rules his people in the world through his law and through his word, which is an expression of the glorious character of our God. In popular culture, there are two narratives that have been classically and popularly, popularly circulated that would foretell something of a projected future among humanity, particularly in the world, in our nation. One of those narratives that have been popularized is Orwell and the book 1984. 1984. And this Orwellian narrative is the epitome of cancel culture. What you see is that if you change the dictionary and the words of the people, you can deceptively alter their entire worldview. It's the idea of breaking down the people by killing good and godly law. But when a good and godly law is destroyed, there's never a vacuum. There will always be a new law put in place. And in that narrative, it is enforced very strictly. And so the idea is that you kill every passion, you control every thought and action, and you put a new law and a new sacrament in honor to a new God in place. But there's been another suggested narrative foretelling a potential future by Huxley in a book called Brave New World. And Brave New World, I believe, characterizes the same issue from a completely different perspective, and it's the idea that we would give ourselves to the epitome of hedonism. Rather than strict enforcement of the law, there would actually be an encouragement of transgressing God's law, to encourage sinful pleasure against the law of God and to callous the conscience 
and even to medicate the conscience against the will and ways of God, to break down the heart, to break down the home, to create a lawless people, and then to erect a new God with a new law to rule those people to whom they would be completely in need of. You have another classic work entitled Fear and Height 451, which is the ridding of any, any remnant of truth, any law in a person's heart. I believe that the idea of the law is a very prevalent and a very necessary topic, not just in classic literature, but in our world today. Think about the public square. We have DAs around the country right now who are not prosecuting crimes that should be prosecuted. And then at the same time, we see our federal government using agencies to weaponize against good and godly citizens. But it's not just outside of us and around us. As we read the scriptures, particularly the book of Romans, we see that this is an issue even within our own hearts. Paul is addressing individual people through the word that think that now they're saved, they can just completely disregard God's law because anything that they do is, here it is, covered by the blood. So just live however you want to live because Jesus has saved us. That is something that you ought not to amen. <laughs> and then on the other hand, we see in the Gospels those who would trust in their own righteousness and law-keeping to justify themselves before God. This is an issue that's brought up in the text before us, and it is not only mentioned, it is central the title of my sermon this morning is A Heart Resolved, Part 2. We're walking through Ezra chapter 7. We covered verses 1 through 6, which we'll recap, and then we'll dive into the heart of verses 7 through 10 and then continue moving along in larger chunks. you remember quite briefly, as we come to the end of chapter 6, that we now are coming off of a very rare section, which is originally recorded in the, in the tongue of Aramaic. He's going to shift back now to Hebrew, and he's also going to take us through a major turning point. 60 years of silence between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7. Through that time, something of Ezra chapter 4, which is fast-forwarded ahead, is taking place. The book of Esther is unfolding, and we are concluding the first wave of Israelite exiles who had returned back to their homeland under the promise of God. Having sin, sinned against God and experienced his judgment, God is showing his mercy and sending them back now in chapter 7 and 8 in a second wave under the man whose name this book is attributed. And so we finally meet this man himself who would lead another way back. It'll be very important to establish who this man is and the credentials that he has laid out in verses 1 through 6, having come from a priestly genealogy. This would be a priest and a scholar, a proclaimer of God's word. And the reason is, is because in chapters 9 and 10, he will confront moral disarray among God's people. And we're going to walk through some interesting passages, and already church members are laughing at me saying, how are you going to handle that, Pastor? To which my answer is, I don't know. I'm only in chapter 7, but we're going to get there. And so in chapters 1 through 6, you see the first wave, chapters 7 through 10, the second wave of returnees, and then the book of Nehemiah the third. Look with me in verses 1 through 6. Last week, we saw, number one, a godly heritage. We walk through a long line of godly men, men sinful in themselves, but having seen God's mercy transformed and used mightily of the Lord. Now in verses 7 through 10, we shift to number 2 this morning. We will drill down on our second point, and that is a resolved heart, a heart set on God's Word. Look with me in verse 1 for a quick recap. We saw in verse 1 that this is during the reign of of King Artaxerxes. We've seen King Cyrus, a pagan king, authorize and send his people back. We've skipped over two other kings not mentioned in this empire, and then we've spent a lot of time under the reign of King Darius. 
We completely skipped the reign of Ahasuerus or Xerxes, and now we're situated during the reign of Artaxerxes. If you'll look with me in verse one and following, we entered this land of giants last Sunday. We retold something of their stories and what God has been doing in and through them and how he continues to use our stories. The mess that we find ourselves in, even as Christians. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything I have learned about the Christian life and pastoral ministry, it is this. Ministry is messy. It is messy. And the lives of these brothers that we covered last week are extremely messy. And God used this glorious mess for his own glory. And so we saw in verse six, if you'll look with me, that we are introduced to Ezra, who went up from Babylonia. Look with me in verse six. Here he is, finally, a skilled scribe in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked. And one of the sweetest summaries in all of Scripture about the most important thing in our lives. For the, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Is there anything you want more, dear Christian, than for God's hand to rest favorably on your life and on your home? God's hand was on him. God's hand was using the sinner saved by grace. So we see in verse six, we're introduced to this skilled scribe. The word skilled, or in the King James Version, ready, literally refers to a quickness of grasp. It refers in and of itself of an ease of movement. And so here's a brother that made his way through the scriptures, quickly grasping it because of a lifelong of devoted study, because of a divine calling on his life. The word scribe originally referred to a state secretary. It was a position that would be appointed, maybe a private royal secretary or a clerk of some sort. Many theologians think that possibly Ezra served in the royal court. He was a sort of royal diplomat, maybe, we don't know. Having become one who would have access to the king, maybe even a political appointee of some sort, who would now be sent out to extend the kingdom of God through this channel. We don't know for sure, but he would probably be familiar with his contemporaries, men by the likes of Daniel and Mordecai and Esther. But as we're introduced to this man and the priority that's put on his life, we see that he was a skilled scribe. The word for scribe would simply become known as someone who studies interprets and copies scripture. And he gives his entire life to this work. The way that this is laid out and descriptive of, of Ezra, it's very clear that here's a man who is well-versed, he was scholarly, and he was an expositor of God's word. He was highly proficient in knowing and handling God's law and then applying it appropriately to the lives of God's people so that they could think the way that God thinks and live the way that God desires, to know and apply Scripture. With Ezra, we would see this special class of teachers. We would see that the downfall of the nation as a whole would come from a lack of good and godly scribes and teaching. So we would have been highly competent by God's grace. Look with me in your Bible he would be skilled in the law of Moses. There's a lot of discussion among scholars about how much of God's law he had, but it seems clear that he had the Torah. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, God's law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, expounded in the first five books of the Bible. We see in Matthew 13, 52, as I mentioned last week, the New Testament says, every scribe, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. He brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Oftentimes when we think of the law and especially God's law, we think drudgery. We think the last thing I want to be thinking about. 
But the scriptures paying God's law is a treasure, and as the scribe, as a museum curator, who is bringing out these treasures before the people, that they might enjoy the character of God through his law. 2 Timothy 2.15 says what I believe would summarize the life of Ezra. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So the New Testament pastor or preacher and elders would need to rightly handle God's word, but I believe that it doesn't stop there. We want God's word to go forth every Lord's Day from the pulpit and then be a channel into the pew. We want it to run through up and down every pew. We want its truths to echo in our hearts so that fathers then take that word and law They take it home to their families and they instruct their families in the ways of God so that mothers are instructing their children as they are instructed themselves so that one who is single knows how to live in a way that's pleasing to God so that we know how to graciously apply this word to one another as a covenant community so that it echoes forth to the nations in every generation where we're showing God's people God's standard where we're showing our sin and theirs, where we're showing our need for God's mercy, where we're showing what a life that's pleasing to God looks like for our own good and God's glory. This is the work of Ezra, and this is the work that continues. We saw last week in verse six, not only a skilled scribe, but a supportive king who gives us blessing on the entire work. And we'll see that more as this chapter progresses. We also saw a sovereign God, for the hand of the Lord is God. God is blessing his life with his favor. And what is attributed to the hand of God being on his life? How might one have the hand of God on his life? I want you to continue to walk with me through this passage as we see what follows. Verse 7. And there went up also to Jerusalem, having established this godly heritage and the credentials of the reformer whom God would raise up. And the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. This places us at the year 458 B.C. Chapter 6 would have closed in 550, 515 B.C., We have to remember that at this point in the life of God's people, that it had been 57 years. So as we have focused on everything that they have been doing to rebuild the worship of God, an entire generation has now arisen. Many from the first generation chose not to return. And so there's a brand new need In the first wave, we see those who went laid out in Ezra 2. In this second wave, where revival and reformation will come again, we see their names laid out in chapter 8. Look with me in Ezra 7, verse 8. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. This would have likely been the first day of the month of Ab, August 4th for us, 458 B.C., according to Jewish tradition. Verse 9, for on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, and here it is again, echoed and emphasized. Children, do your parents ever repeat things to you quite often? Do they ever say things to you so much that you can repeat the end of the phrase before it even leaves their tongue? Do you know why they do that? Because it's so important that you know. Adults, you know why the Lord does that with us? He's emphasizing a point. And here it is in verse 9. All of this is attributed to the good hand of his God on him. God is... Guiding all of this, God is doing all of this. God is showing favor upon his servant in all of this. 
And Ezra is serving as a holy man of God right there at the seat of this evil empire in Babylon. And so we're landing in verse 9 at the departure date, the month of Nisan, in the spring, 458 B.C. If you'll look with me in chapter 8, verse 15 and following, there's actually going to be a delay. They won't leave until the 12th. But you understand that, don't you? How many of you have ever set a time to leave on vacation or a trip and you're still sitting there 15 minutes later? An hour, two hours, three hours. They will get delayed in chapter 8 because Ezra will have to search for more Levites to go. But as you consider the date that's set and the date in which they would leave, it seems to echo Exodus 12, 2, Numbers 33, Isaiah 11 when the original captives would set out from Exodus. It could be that the author is painting a sort of new Exodus, a new beginning, a brand new fresh start. This trip would have lasted between eight and 900 miles, a long, hot, dangerous journey. They would have had plenty of children and families and all of them going together. The 500-mile direct route through the desert during the summer would be highly unlikely. And if you live in Alabama during the months of July and August, you can understand. It would have taken about three and a half months if they walked 10 miles a day. And remember that I said walk. (laughs) We're told in this passage that they then set out and then look at the one whom God would raise up and the pace that would be set in verse 10, which will occupy the rest of our time this morning. One of the most important classic turn to verses in all of the Old Testament, and for good reason. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. My favorite commentator of Ezra, Derek Kidner, put it this way. He is a model reformer in that what he taught, he had first lived. And what he lived, he had first made sure of in the scriptures. With study, conduct, and teaching put deliberately in this right order, each of these was able to function properly at its best. Study was saved from unreality, conduct from uncertainty, and teaching from insincerity and shallowness. Look with me in verse 10. It literally reads in the ESV, set his heart. The heart is the center, the mainspring, the core of a person's being, the totality of who they are. Other translations read, prepared his heart, are firmly resolved, are devoted himself to. So God is promising to send his people out in a new exile or from an exile in a new exodus. He's promising to spread his glory to the ends of the earth. God is promising a brand new reformation and revival. God is going to shake up the entire world and bring note to who he is. And here's the game plan for how He will change the world. What is the recipe and how will he do it? Interestingly, Ezra does not come with lights or fog machines. He does not come with charismatic personalities or tricks and con artists. Here's the game plan. Get the word of God. Study the word of God. Do the word of God and teach other people to do the same. That's it. Rinse and repeat and trust God for the results. Here's a man who's introduced as loving God's word and more specifically as law and he loved God's people. As we'll see, he'll give himself totally to their care. He'll have a diligent and careful search of the scriptures, particularly the legal content of the scriptures that have very important practical applications for the way that they would live ethically. And it's from this law that we're introduced to now that we find not a heavy burden 
but we find life-giving nourishment for the soul, God-honoring direction for the life. He set his heart. All of us have hearts that are being set in one way or the other. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 13. So King Rehoboam grew strong in Jerusalem and reigned. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen, and he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. You ever had a project around the house that involved pouring concrete? You don't pour concrete very long before you learn a basic kindergarten level. And by the way, that's the way I need it, on the kindergarten level when it comes to home projects. And here's what you learn real quick. You pour it the way that you want it, and if you need to fix it, you do it quick. Because the longer it sets, the harder it sets. And the longer we live, the more our hearts tend to set in the mold of which they're fixed. And here's a king that refused to set his heart to seek the things of God. And it can be plowed up, but it'll take a jackhammer. Where are our hearts set this morning? It would take a jackhammer in Hosea chapter 10 because the Bible said that Israel would develop a false heart. They would utter empty promises with no fear of God before their face. They would live like a vine that had been planted in luxury. But the more the altars of Israel would increase, the more her fields would produce, the more her, her country would improve, the higher her pride would soar. And God would say that it all would have to be broken and she would have to bear the guilt of her sin. But there's another man in scriptures that would set his heart or his face with terminology that would lead us to believe that there would be another exodus that would be accomplished, the one to whom all of these would point. Luke 9, 51, when the days draw near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, but the people did not receive him. They set their hearts against him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Christ would set his own heart to save the hearts of rebel sinners like you and me. And then he would give his word in 2 Timothy 3, as Brian read. And he would tell young Lieutenant Timothy, as the world goes from chaos to depravity on in, you set your heart to seek your God through his word. That's where your heart needs to be set. My question for us this morning to consider is where are our hearts? Where are they set? As our hands go through the normal expected motion, where are our hearts set? Do you want to know the roadmap to your heart and my heart? Can I help us with just a couple of very tangible mental exercises? Just look at your checkbook and your calendar. Where do we spend our time and where do we spend our money? And oftentimes, we will find that as a breadcrumb to lead us right back to what could be idols in our hearts. This world has a lot of fancy distractions. This world has a lot of competing loyalties for our hearts. And I'm here to remind myself and to convince you, don't buy it. It will not produce what it promises. Set your heart with Ezra on the treasure of God's word and love it with the, every fiber of your being. It will prove to be true and honey to your heart. So he set his heart. He was a priest. We see from Deuteronomy 33 and again in Malachi 2 that the priestly tribe of Levi was blessed with God and called to guard God's law and to instruct the people in all that it said. So a reformation is coming 
And God, ground zero, is using the preaching of his law to bring revival and reformation. So look with me through the order of it in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, and the game plan is very, very simple, which is how we like it and it's how we need it. And here it is. Number one, the game plan is to know God's word. Have I said anything profound so far? To study the law of the Lord. To study the law of the Lord. Which really, first of all, assumes that we're actually reading God's law. Do you read God's word on a regular basis, day in and day out? This is just Christianity 101, like this is just sitting in the high chair doing motions, more please, I need some food, I gotta have some nourishment, we haven't even gotten out of the high chair, and even when you do, you never graduate from the need for God's word, but we're just in the high chair. Are we reading God's word regularly in our homes? Are we reading it in our marriages? Are we flooding our homes with the reading of God's word? You say, I have no clue how to teach my family. Are you just reading it? Is it taking center place? Because it is life-giving. So he's studying the law of the Lord. Tradition would say that quite possibly he had memorized the entire law of the Lord, which is why last week I suggested that we stop doing the verse of the month and we start doing the book of the month. So we just memorize a whole book but then we're both in trouble if we do that. So maybe we'll just stick with the verse of the month. But he's doing exegesis. He's studying the scriptures so that he can position himself underneath the scriptures and then pull out from the scriptures what they mean and then how to apply it to his life and the people around it. They're sitting and humbling themselves underneath the preaching of God's word. Let me ask you, when you read God's word, when you hear God's word preached, is there always a critique in your heart? Is there always something that the one reading it or the one preaching it say that he shouldn't have said or or didn't say that he should? Or is there always something going on in your mind? Is there always, I know what the Bible says, but can you and I ever be corrected by the Bible? Or do we sit above the Bible because it can never mean what it actually clearly and plainly says because we can find so many ways to maneuver in pious direction so that we don't have to actually be held accountable for what it says. Do we study God's law and humble ourselves underneath its teachings so that it rains on our souls like a refreshing river? We read a significant amount of scripture every Sunday. Let's come hungry and hard to hear it. Why do we study the word? To know the Lord of the law by knowing the law of the Lord. If we were to gauge the spiritual health of our country and especially even the church based on biblical literacy alone, I am afraid that we're in serious trouble. But biblical illiteracy is not a new problem, although it is a serious problem. Because in Israel, we have another entirely different generation that has arose, and they are deeply in need of God's law, and we're gonna see that as the book goes on. God has given us a book. Let's love the book. Look with me in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, will you please turn there and get there as fast as you can? Verse 97. We could read the whole psalm, but we would be here all day. Psalm 119, 97. If you're not there, keep racing till you get there. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. I can't get it off my mind all day long. That's where I want to be. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Just listen to the experts. 
You know the guys in white coats? I also know other people that wear white coats, and they don't live in academic uh, academies. They live in institutions. So we don't always want to trust the experts, but where we can become experts is in verse 98. God's law ever being with us. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the age, for I keep your precepts. I hold my feet back from every evil path in order to keep your word. This is our heart's desire, even if it isn't the reality in our life that we want it to be. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth. Can we say that this morning? Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. May we love God's word and his law, and may we use it lawfully, that it may give us a nose to sniff out error and sin in every way that's not pleasing to God. But then the next aspect that we see here is to obey God's word. Look with me in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. You know, it would be so easy, especially in a camp among Reformed brothers and sisters like you and I, and this has been a problem in our church through the years, to get big heads and to think that we know something because we read the Bible and we're in church and we study the Bible and we've read a book or two through the years. So we think that we have something of Christian maturity because we know a thing or two. But that is only the beginning point. Look with me in verse 10. And to do it. At the very heart of the Great Commission itself given by Jesus Christ in Matthew 28 is to teach them to what? Observe everything that he commanded. To do it all. It has implications for all of life, so all of it needs to be taught and all of it needs to be sought to put into practice and we'll need all of God's grace to do it. But here's the warning. Look with me in James chapter one, verse 22. And if this does not make the hairs on your neck stand up when you read it, Houston, we have a serious problem. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You know what bothers me most about God's word? There's so many things. We could have a Q&A with the pastor right now, and you could probably go all day long asking me questions that I cannot answer. You ever gone to the doctor, ask him a question? And he answers every question but yours. And you say, you don't know the answer, but you don't want to tell me, do you? <laughs> you don't have a clue what the answer is. I'll just tell you, I don't know. But it's not the parts that I don't know that bother me most. What bothers me most are the parts that I do know, but I failed to do it the way that I should. But the one who looks perfectly into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. At marriage counseling, here's what we want to be doing. This is the goal to work through the problems in our marriage. Come back the next week. I did everything that you told me to do, and still I have problems. <laughs> Let's do it longer than a week. <laughs> Let's persevere. I know I need it. Maybe you do too. Endure, and you'll be blessed. But here's the difficulty, here's the sting that I feel, and maybe you do too. No preacher, no person can ever live up to the standard of God's law that we proclaim. Question. If your father raised your hand. You ever attempted to teach your family something of God's law? And no sooner than it got off your mouth, instantly you were convicted and you thought, I ain't even doing this in my own life the way I should. Well, congratulations, because that's how I feel every Sunday. Who is sufficient for this? 
but we proclaim the standard of God's law. We don't lower it, and then we ask for God's mercy and his grace and strength that he would help us to live out all of his truths. Friends, if we do not do God's law, and if we get rid of God's law, we will not live in a vacuum. We will simply obey another law. There will always be a law that we are subject to. And that law will always come with another God and another set of sacraments. But this is the law that we're blessed in living in accordance with. And so we seek to do it. You say, to do what? Everything that Jesus commanded in all of his word, and that'll take all of our lives. The whole of scripture, the whole of life. Look with me in verse 10. You say, okay, point three for this reformation, for this revival, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So in verse 14 and then in verse 24, the king will send Ezra back to Jerusalem to teach the law of God, to set up judges and magistrates to help the people sort through their problems. So Ezra is putting his bucket deep into the well of God's word, drawing out living water and then expounding it before the people so that they can hear it, understand it, and seek to live it out. Acts 20, 27 says, teach the whole counsel of God. 2 Timothy 2, 2 says, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, in one sense, as we think about this idea of teaching God's statutes and rules, his decrees and his law, the Bible says that we who presume to be teachers will be judged more strictly, which is why I'm always deeply concerned when someone is running to lecture or preach or anything of that sort, it makes me think we really don't understand the seriousness of what we're doing. But in another sense, we're all teachers of some sort, fathers and mothers, families and grandparents, the older women in the church to the younger, the older men to the younger, we're all in various ways and formats extending the truths of God's word, seeking to apply them to our own lives and help one another to live in light of them. And if we're going to do that, we've got to know his word and then we've got to not sit and soak and sour with that word. We've got to be externally focused with it. Acts 20, 32, Paul said, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. So what does this look like? In Nehemiah chapter eight, verse five, we have these statutes or these decrees. Then we have these rules or these judgments or laws, these duties. So they're going forth and Ezra is trying to Teach a biblical worldview to all of life. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, later we will get to the place where Ezra will, will gather the priests and the Levites. And Ezra the scribe, the passage says, will be lifted up and that he will teach God's word to the people and that he will appoint others to help them understand it. And this is exactly what we do in light of the New Testament, we commit ourselves to gathering every Lord's Day around God's Word that it might correct us and comfort us and send us out. Pastor Derek Thomas puts it this way, a new generation whose grandparents and great-grandparents had built the second temple now occupied the city. These Jews were in need of a preacher, someone who would proclaim the word of God with personal application to the conscience. They were in need of relearning the gravity of sin, and this they could do only by being reacquainted with the demands of God's law in all its particulars. They did not need someone to salve their consciences with smooth words and lull them to sleep 
in the assurance that all is well. They needed someone who could put the fear of God into their souls and awaken them to the peril of presumptive religion. And it was to this urgent task that God raised up Ezra. One more passage, please put before you. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. We read this passage last Sunday, and I really want us to see this again because the rest of this book will be given to unpacking the things that we're walking through right now. Psalm 19, verse seven. These words never get old, no matter how many times I read them. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Do you need your soul revived this morning? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Do you need your eyes open this morning? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. This is our compass. This is how we know truth. More to be desired are they than gold, even much than fine gold. Here it is again, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. And God is showcasing his character to his people and through them to the world, to the law. So here we are. Ground zero at one of the most important topics in the entire Christian life having read so many different passages about God's law, 1 Timothy 1.8 says that God's law is good so long as we use it lawfully. What, dear friends, is the good and lawful use of the law of God? What place does the law of God have in our lives, if any? How do we relate to the law? The Puritans wrote more about this subject than perhaps any other. Reformed theologians have long understood three categories of God's law. We have civil laws given to govern Israel, and our confession now gives us what's called the general equity. We find the, the general truths and principles behind all those laws. We have the ceremonial laws, such as offerings and festivals and sacrifices. And Jesus Christ fulfilled all of them as the lamb to whom they all pointed. We have moral laws, ethical commands repeated in the New Testament for all people to obey. They're not broke down that succinctly, but that is classically what Reformed theologians have understood. But what I want us to understand this morning is extremely important. I want to show you how we are to rightly understand God's law in three Simple points. First of all, God's law in general was given for the conviction of sin. For the conviction of sin. God's law is punitive. The law of the land is punitive. It's to punish those who cross it. But it's also pedagogical, meaning it instructs. There's something about the law that calibrates our consciences and our heart to have an understanding of what's right based on what's inscribed and promoted and expressed as the law, which is why it is so incredibly dangerous when we have laws that contradict God's word and character and law because they begin to teach people that things are good that are wicked and things that are wicked are good. The Bible teaches, and we know this as Reformed believers, that we are totally depraved. But that does not mean that we are externally as sinful as we could be. And that does not mean that we act out the wickedness of our hearts that we already have on the inside. We could always say, no matter how wickedly we live, show me more, and we could. What that means is that we are thoroughly depraved in every faculty of our lives our hearts who can trust it, our emotions are flighty, our minds 
through the noetic effects of the fall, don't think rightly. Everything that we do has been polluted and perverted in some way by sin. And the law has a restraining effect in our life. And there's no neutral zone. We will always be governed by one law or another. So when law is clarified and enforced, it has a tendency to restrain the effects of sin. You know that you and I both believe this. How many of you would be willing to admit, I have a problem at times of being a little heavy on the pedal, maybe going a little faster than I should. Almost no one's raising their hand. Three-fourths of you are smiling because you know we're guilty. And if there's any police officers in here, we would appreciate it if you would just keep looking at the preacher right now. But we all know what slows us down because we love this country and we want to just do what's right. We know that sign says 55, and if we go over, the blue light special could be behind us at any time, so we slow down. There's... There's a way that the law can have a restraining effect to curb the effects of sin. And I want us to understand in the wider public square that legislation will never change human hearts and we can't expect it to. But you know what legislation can do? It can save lives. Even though many people who will murder their babies may not be saved, I would at least appreciate it if they would stop murdering their babies. This is one aspect of God's law, not to change the heart, but to restrain sin for the sake of exposing and curbing human decadence and leading to human flourishing, even if that is the law of God written on our hearts, natural law displayed in our consciences, and certainly God's explicit law in his word. But I want to give you a second use of God's law, and this is most important. God's law in general was given for the conversion of sinners. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. And now we're no longer able to keep God's law. And as soon as you think you can, you just broke it and you became a self-righteous Pharisee. If you break it at any point, dear friend, you are guilty of breaking all of it. The only way that you and I, in and of ourselves, can ever keep God's law and have the assurance that we can is to lower it down to our level and water it down enough to our own human sinfulness. Friends, the purpose of God's law, secondly, was to humble us and to show us that we can never do what it requires. Will you come to church with me? Will you listen to the word of God? One day I will. One day I'm gonna clean my life up enough and I'm gonna get down there and I'm gonna go to church with you. One day I'm gonna clean my life up enough and I'm gonna listen to this. I'm gonna try to do this. No, you won't. No, you won't. No, none of us will. Because God's law humbles us before God and it leaves us at the place that we needed to be the whole time, desperately cast before the mercy of Jesus Christ, sitting before a fountain that is filled with blood that has been drawn from the veins of our Savior who invites us to get in and swim around and be forgiven of all of our transgressions because Jesus Christ perfectly kept the law of God in our place and today he can freely justify you from all of your sins if you would put all of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Sweetheart, that applies to you if you're four or five years old. Dear sir, that applies to you if you're at the end of life. That applies to anyone under the sound of this word that would be convicted of their sins and their law-breaking and trust God. Trust God. And so the Pharisees constructed a law that they thought that they could keep, and they became self-righteous. But there's a third purpose to God's law, and I want us to see this because I believe that this is completely neglected today in many churches. 
The law was given not only for the conviction of sin, number one, the conversion of sinners, number two, but for the conformity of saints. How many of you, your heart's desire, I know it is, that you want more than anything, you want to be godly. More than anything, you want Christ to be formed in you. You want to be Christ-like in everything that you do. God, we lament that it's not so, and we want it more than it is. But the question is, what is it like to live godly? What is it like to be Christ-like? Put a tangible picture around that frame. It means that we live in accordance with God's law. Puritan Samuel Bolton put it this way, the law sends us to the gospel that we may be justified, and the gospel sends us to the law again to inquire what is our duty as those who are justified. This Puritan said, and I, I read this this week and about fell out of my chair He said, fear may restrain, though it cannot renew man. Fear may suppress sin, though faith alone conquers and overcomes sin. The law may chain up the wolf, but it is the gospel that changes the wolfish nature. The one who stops the streams, the other heals the fountain. The one who restrains the practices, the other renews the principles. So now that we are in Christ and we trust what he did through keeping the law, to justify us, and we're right before God, how then shall we live? I'm glad you asked. The new covenant was promised in the Old Testament that God would write his law in the hearts of his people, and he would cause them to want to follow after the ways of God, to not live like the Gentiles, but to want to live according to the ways of God, to honor him, to say this home does not honor God the way that it should, and we want it to, and we want it to with joy. We want our lives to be honored around what honors God. Friends, this is not legalism. This is not obeying God's law to earn your way. Hear me out. This is love obeying God out of love for him. 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, turn there with me. It's one passage of many, which states the truth plainly. We want to talk about love, and we should talk about love. I just want to love God. Me too, what do we mean by that? What does that look like? Does that mean that we celebrate Pride Month? Well, what, is, what is that? What do you even mean by that? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome because he's changed our hearts to want to live according to his ways. God, help us. God, change us. Chapter 19 of the London Baptist Confession opens up another treasure chest. Please listen to the wisdom that our forefathers laid forth. It clarifies everything in a word. True believers are not under the law as a covenant of works. In other other words, to save us, to be justified or condemned by it. Yet it is very useful to them and to others as a rule of life that informs them of the will of God and their duty. It directs and obligates them to live according to its precepts. It also exposes the sinful corruptions of their natures, hearts, and lives. I mean, here it is, guys. If you don't like it, don't argue with me. Argue with the writers of the confession and in the Bible. As they examine themselves in light of the law, they come to further conviction of humiliation for, and hatred of sin. It's why we have a prayer confession every Sunday. Along with a clear view of their need for Christ and the perfection of his obedience, the law is also useful to the regenerate, to restrain their corruptions because it forbids sin. The punishment threatened by the law shows them what even their sins deserve, and that includes me, first and foremost, and what troubles they may expect in this life due to their sin. If you take a train off its tracks so that it doesn't run the way that it should, you're going to have problems every time. And our country's in the middle of an experiment 
to prove that so. Even though they are freed from the curse and undiminished severity of it, the promises of the law likewise show them God's approval of obedience and the blessings they may expect when they keep it, even though these blessings are not owed to them by the law as a covenant of works. If people do good and refrain from evil because the law encourages good and discourages evil, that does not indicate that they are under the law and not under grace. These uses of the law are not contrary to the grace of the gospel, but are in sweet harmony with it. For the Spirit of Christ subdues and enables the human will to do freely and cheerfully what the will of God is revealed in the law requires. We have laws in our home. And God has given laws to us, and we have laws that we expect obedience to. And it gives me joy to watch my children do what they're told to do when they're told. You know it gives me greater joy when they do it from the heart because they want to do it, because they love God, because God has changed their heart. Is anything of that reflected in our heavenly Father? If we would be mighty in God's word, then we must be mighty in God's word. Another reformation would come, and Martin Luther would said of this one that it would be God's word that did it all. Friends, in summary, I believe we live in a day when the church is trying its best to reinvent itself with a barrage of busy programs for entertainment for the kids and any number of fancy things like that. The church is trying to keep up with the culture so as not to get a bad rap with the world to appease its members to compromise at every turn. And I'm here to tell you, I believe that we simply just need God's word again. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you put these things before the brothers, 1 Timothy 4, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Here's the closing exhortation have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For, this, for to this end we toil and strive. Why, and what's the point of all of it? Because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. God's Word leads us to God, to know God and to know Him and His Son, Jesus Christ, who kept His law in our place. God's Word brings life. It's a means of grace for growth in the church to open the eyes of sinners, to be presented with the truths of Christ. May we be like Samuel. May we be like Samuel. The Bible says that Samuel's heart was, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And 1 Samuel 3.19 says that the Lord would be with Samuel and he would let none of his words fall to the ground. May we seek to study that we might obey, that we might obey by faith and extend God's word and glory to every nation and every generation. Let's ask God's help in this. Father, we thank you for presenting us with Christ who died in our place. We pray for the Holy Spirit. Would you help us, Lord? We need it. Father, we thank you for designing all of this. We pray this message would fall fruitfully and give life to your people and call salvation in the world. Lord, we just want to thank you for your word. You've been good to us. 
more than we'll ever deserve. Help us rest in you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.